Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Before I start, I wanted to uh, let you know that at approximately 10.30 this morning uh, in the Oval Office, the President was notified by his Homeland Security Advisor, John Brennan, uh, of the shooting in Newtown, Connecticut at a school. The President is receiving regular updates as more information becomes available about this incident. Uh, and uh, as the day proceeds, if we get more information and as we get more information, we'll certainly provide it to you. I do not have uh, anything to confirm for you at this point. Uh, the FBI is uh, supporting state law enforcement, which has the lead, as well as local law enforcement as they respond to and begin to investigate this incident. Uh, and as I said, the President will receive regular updates as the day progresses. I'll take your questions. Okay, one follow on that. Can you relate to us any of the President's reactions or thoughts? Obviously, these shootings are all, all of them are tragic. We're hearing some particularly heinous numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that children were involved. Uh, I would rather not relay uh, reactions at this point because I don't have any confirmation to give to you uh, about what exactly has happened there or uh, potential victims. So at this point I'd rather just uh, inform you that the President has been uh, informed about the shooting, was informed at 1030, and is being given regular updates as more information becomes available. Any thoughts on whether we will be able to hear from him today? <clears throat> you know, we'll just have to keep you updated. Uh, uh, as more information becomes available. Two other topics. Uh, in the ABC News interview, the President was asked about uh, the uh, legalization of marijuana in a couple of states where voters have sounded off on that and uh, essentially said that um, it's not a high priority for him, no pun intended, I guess, to, uh, to go after recreational users. Um, but obviously this is a serious issue, uh, states' rights versus federal rights. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if there's any concern that the President's comments c could signal that to states, you know, it's okay to, to go ahead and pursue your own policies on marijuana. We're not going to enforce it at the federal level. Well, that wasn't <clears throat> what the President said. I think uh, there is clearly a conflict here between federal law and uh, state laws now in these, in these states. And that is being reviewed, uh, the ballot initiatives, by the Department of Justice. And I would direct you to them for updates on that review. Uh, what the President was saying, I think, uh, is uh, much as he has said about uh, the use of medical marijuana, that uh, in prioritizing our law enforcement objectives, that uh, pursuing uh, recreational users of marijuana in states where it has been, through a ballot initiative, declared legal is not a top priority, uh, would not be a top priority. Uh, given, as the President said, there are bigger fish, fish to fry, more uh, important law enforcement priorities. Uh, but the law is the law, and that is why uh, he is, uh, has directed the Department of Justice to review these ballot initiatives and uh, to make some assessments about how to proceed. But is it his view, and has he directed the Department of Justice to continue to enforce federal law? Uh, it is certainly uh, our responsibility and his responsibility and the executive branch's responsibility to enforce, enforce the law. It is also the responsibility of uh, law enforcement agencies at the federal level to make, uh, to have priorities in the enforcement of uh, the law, and that, and that is certainly his position. Last topic on the fiscal cliff, one of the TV interviews the President had yesterday. He uh, was asked about the, the political dynamic, and he said, uh, referring to Speaker Boehner, I think Speaker Boehner has a contentious caucus, and his caucus is tough on him sometimes, so he doesn't want to look like he's giving in to me somehow because that might hurt him in his own caucus. I I'm wondering how that kind of comment, uh, obviously candid, but doesn't that hurt um, the trust, uh, no comment dynamic you guys have tried to foster when the President says, uh, you know, he doesn't want to look like he's giving in to me. He's got problems with his own caucus. Doesn't that hurt the dynamic? Well, it, what we have done is not comment on the internal discussions that he has had with the Speaker and uh, Secretary Geithner and Rob Neighbors and others have had with uh, leaders on the Hill and their staffs. I think what the President said is reflected in reams of reporting by, I'm sure, you and others, your organization and others, about 
the internal dynamics within the House Republican Conference. I, you know, I think that's a, a fairly standard observation uh, that the President made yesterday. Jay, if I could ask about the in connection with the shootings. Um, yesterday and today, uh, obviously tragic events. Do these raise uh, limiting handgun violence or other gun violence on the President's list of priorities in any way? We're still waiting for more information about the incident in Connecticut. As we do, uh, I think it's important on a day like today to view this as I know the President as a father does and I as a father and others uh, who are parents uh, certainly do, which is to uh, feel enormous sympathy for families that are affected and to do everything we can to support state and local law enforcement and to support those who are enduring uh, what appears to be a very tragic event. There is, uh, I'm sure, uh, will be rather a day for discussion of the usual Washington policy debates, but I don't think today is that day. Could we turn then to the fiscal cliff. Uh, can you say more about how the meeting went with Speaker Boehner last night? Where do things stand now? Are there plans for further talks? Mm -hmm. Did you make progress? Is this a stalemate? The President's meeting with the Speaker of the House uh, was uh, frank. Uh, it lasted a little less than an hour. And the lines of communication remain open. I don't know why I see smiles in response to that. Uh, very candid assessment. Uh, you know, the President continues to believe that a deal is possible, uh, that not only uh, confronts the deadlines associated with the so-called fiscal cliff, but allows us to um, achieve something far bigger, which is uh, a broader compromise, a balanced compromise that significantly reduces our deficits and uh, puts us on a fiscally sustainable path. That is the deal that the President seeks. Uh, and we hope that uh, Republicans are willing to compromise in order to achieve that goal with him. It remains the case that on some of the fundamental issues uh, at, that are matters of debate, we have yet to see uh, any change in the position of the Republican leadership. It is still their position, as they tell you when you ask them, that they want extension of the high-end Bush tax cuts. That is not going to happen. The President will not sign such legislation. It is still a fact that, in contrast to what the President has done, which is to put forward uh, specific proposals for both spending cuts and uh, revenue increases, the Republican leadership has yet to give us a single specific, a single specific about what they want to cut, how they would do it, how they would raise revenue. All of that at this, this point remains lacking. Uh, but the President believes that the parameters of a deal are quite clear. Uh, a willingness by the leadership to acknowledge that rates have to go up on the top 2% uh, would uh, potentially move us more quickly towards the achievement of a deal, uh, but that has yet to happen. Okay, the Speaker is in Ohio this weekend. The President has plans himself to go on holiday a week from today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the deadline draws closer. Uh, is it the White House's calculus that um, if the nation does in fact go off the fiscal cliff, the, the blame, the burden of the blame will fall uh, on the Republican side, uh, Secretary Geithner said uh, not that long ago that uh, absolutely uh, that there would be willingness to go off the cliff if there was no acceptable deal. The President's not interested in apportioning blame. He's interested in reaching a deal. Uh, 
he is most concerned about middle class families and the impact on them should taxes go up on everybody on January 1st, which would be nonsensical given that everyone in Washington, Republican and Democrat alike, says they support extending tax cuts for the 98 percent, uh, everyone except for the top 2 percent of earners in the, in the country. So he, he, his position has been and continues to be that one way to send an important single signal to the American people, to the middle class, that Washington is functioning and not punishing them would be to pass tax cuts that everyone says they support. He would sign that into law right away. Uh, I'm not going to speculate about uh, what would unfold should Republicans continue to refuse to uh, accept that rates have to go up on the top 2 percent. You know, the President is still pursuing a deal. Yeah. Stipulating that you probably have no personnel announcements to make, uh, does the president think that it is uh, would be appropriate for Senator Kerry to recuse himself from chairing the uh, Senate hearings next week in the Benghazi uh, incidents? I think the stipulation that you made uh, should be applied broadly in reference to uh, matters like that because it's all about uh, issues of personnel and. I haven't asked that question, but I, again, I'm not going to, uh, you know, go down paths that are uh, lead to so discussions about the personnel. White and House isn't going to weigh in on one way or another. It doesn't uh, have I certainly am not weighing in on that today. Uh, given that the president's not running for re-election, uh, and he previously barring a change in the constitution, right? And he previously made a campaign <laughs> promise to oppose. Um, <laughs> and previously made a campaign promise to work to renew the assault weapons ban. Why won't you stand up here today and say that that remains a commitment of his? It does remain a commitment of his. What I said is that today is not the day to. In, I believe. Uh, as a father, a day to engage in the usual Washington policy debates. I think that that day you know, will come, uh, but today's not that day, especially as we are awaiting more information for the about the situation in Connecticut. Yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying about the events today, mm -hmm. uh, so I, but I'm going to ask a question about entitlement spending, if that's okay. Well, sure. Okay. So. Uh, does the President think uh, that the entitlement spending or social welfare spending, whatever you want to call it, uh, is on a sustainable path as it exists right now? The President believes that Medicare in particular, uh, and more broadly our health care entitlements, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, need to be adjusted in ways that protect beneficiaries and protect the integrity of the programs, uh, but bring about savings. Uh, he achieved that. Uh, significantly in the Affordable Care Act and seeks to achieve additional savings in a compromise deal with Congress uh, that would reduce our deficits on the order of four trillion dollars over ten years. So absolutely he, he recognizes that uh, health care entitlements are significant drivers of our deficits. So the answer is no, he does not think they're on a sustainable path right now without any changes. Well, it depends on how, what, what you mean by sustainable, but certainly the, the, the numbers show that uh, for example, because of the, of the President's action, Medicare's, uh, you know, sustainability was uh, advanced by a number of years, uh, but more action needs to be taken. He absolutely agrees with that premise. Does he think that the changes he proposes in his budget uh, make it sustainable? Is it enough what the, the, what the President has suggested doing in his, in his budget? Would that be enough to make Medicare and other health care programs sustainable? He believes that uh, in combination with the health cost savings uh, brought about by, according to the CBO, uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act and the deficit reduction brought about by the Affordable Care Act, that the uh, reforms that he has proposed would significantly uh, expand the sustainability of these programs and uh, that obviously down the road more work would be done. But there has been no proposal uh, that uh, solves f for time immemorial the uh, the challenge faced by, uh, you know, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid uh, in perpetuity. But the President believes we need to take significant action to uh, rein in our deficits, 
bring down our deficits as a percentage of uh, the economy uh, to a level that is sustainable and that uh, would give a boost to our economy uh, and through other measures that invest in the economy, help the economy grow and create jobs that would put us in an even better position as we move along to uh, continue to address these challenges. So he is, again, the only member of this debate, a participant in this debate, who's put forward specific uh, spending cuts of any kind and specific spending cuts uh, garnered from our health care entitlements. I mean, this is one of the, I think it's, people are beginning to notice this. I noticed in the press this morning that our counterparts here have yet to put or mention a single cut. I mean, they, they spend, they, the speaker says the spending is the problem, uh, but I, I think none of you have been able to elicit from him or other Republican leaders exactly what it is they want to do, what it is they well, propose. In their letter, they talked about raising the eligibility age for Medicare. That would, that would be a, a cut or an adjustment, I, I right? I think you're referring to comments made by Senator McConnell. There has been no proposal of any specificity from Republicans uh, to us about what they would do to in the letter from Boehner to the Geithner to the original Geithner proposal, there was no I don't believe mention of the eligibility age of Medicare from 55 to 57, and I, I'll look at that again. And, but and there the, is uh, and the CPI that there was, wasn't, there, that was wasn't no the there has been no specific <clears throat> proposal uh, from the Republicans. Uh, other ideas have been bandied about in the press, uh, but again, we look for if 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 the Republicans want to put forward specific proposals to us that. Uh, either build on or replace the cuts the president has proposed. Uh, you know, we would uh, look, like to see them, but you haven't seen that, and I, you know I haven't seen the speaker uh, mention any in any of his press conferences uh, or other public presentations. Is the, pre the last question is uh, is the president? <coughs> what reforms to um, <coughs> entitlement programs, for want of a better term? Uh, is the president willing to make beyond the ones that he has proposed in his budget? Well, as, as uh, you know, not for the sake enticing of, not as for the sake of negotiation sure, but as from the podium, as but the for the sake of the solvency of the programs. Well, sure, but that would be negotiating with ourselves and basically uh, saying what we're willing to do when the Republicans haven't demonstrated a willingness to do anything uh, when it comes to revenue uh, or, for that matter, spending cuts. The President's put forward very specific spending cuts, including in entitlements, uh, including some uh, structural reforms to entitlements, and uh, is willing to discuss and entertain other uh, cuts uh, that um, make sense and uh, would work as part of a broader package for deficit reduction. But thus far, the Republican position, uh, in, you know, which goes against vast public opinion, goes against what we learned in the election, goes against, uh, you know, everything that was debated for the past 12 months, is that they demand permanent extension of the Bush high-end tax cuts for the wealthy. Um, that's just not going to happen, and I think it's important that uh, we reiterate that the President will not sign a bill that extends uh, those tax rates for millionaires and billionaires and everyone making over $250,000. It's, it's bad economic policy, and I had a little fun yesterday talking about, you know, we have a little recent history to compare uh, which kinds of economic plans work and the impact of uh, various tax rates on economic growth. And contra uh, contrary to everything they say about the calamity that would befall America if the wealthy were asked to pay a little bit more, the evidence decisively proves otherwise. Yeah. What's your reaction to the folks on the left who say the President didn't aggressively defend Susan Rice enough? I think you, broadly speaking, were in the audience when the President made his views about the unfair uh, attacks on Susan Rice very well known and very clear. Um, and I think you saw in the President's statement yesterday uh, his belief that uh, those attacks were um, misguided and unfair. But he still apparently and let me just say, if I may, the resignation or, or, or withdrawal without pushing back. Well, uh, it should hardly be a negative that someone of Susan Rice's enormous character would be willing to, uh, viewing the situation, uh, put the country's interests and uh, above her own personal interests and 
uh, seeing the kind of political circus that had been created around the mere potential of her nomination uh, make the decision that uh, it was not in uh, the country's interest, given all of the major foreign policy issues that confront us, uh, the President's interest, uh, for her to uh, be considered for Secretary of State. If I could, uh, just as a make a point here, that the leading critics of Ambassador Rice with their wildly unfounded uh, assertions have a spotty record at best when it comes to making judgments about who is qualified for high office in this country. Susan Rice is enormously qualified for the job that she has uh, and for any potential job serving her country that she might have in the future. Who are you referring to? Spotty record about them? Leading critics uh, of uh, No, I mean, what's their spotty record? You just generically saying they have a spotty record? Yeah, to deduce. <laughs> yeah, Major. Did the President, the Vice President, or the Chief of Staff recommend, advise, or suggest to Susan Rice that she withdraw? I would point you to what Ambassador Rice herself has said, and the answer is that uh, she took this action herself. And, uh, you know, the, the President uh, has enormous regard for Ambassador Rice, is uh, extremely appreciative of uh, her service, and uh, is grateful for the fact that she will continue at the United Nations. This is a purely organic conclusion she came to. Again, I would point you to her assertions of just that. And again, I think it, it shows um, a great deal about her character and uh, what her priority is. something going on in this town, in your opinion? Oh, I think it's fair to say that this situation is the result of the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of practices in Washington that uh, are extremely regrettable because this all began because of her appearances on a, sun, on a series of Sunday shows in which she presented information given to her by the intelligence community that was provided also to the Hill and everyone else. Uh, there, was, there were the best assessments that they had made about what had happened in Benghazi. It remains to this day that the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations is not responsible for uh, the collection or evaluation of intelligence or for security of diplomatic facilities around the world. And uh, to somehow make judgments about uh, her qualifications for a different office uh, based on absurd allegations uh, surrounding her performance on those Sunday shows is politics at its worst. Why accept something that many regard as a defeat for this administration? Well, I, I, I disagree. First of all, the President uh, had not made a decision uh, about his uh, next Secretary of State. Secondly, uh, it, again, says a lot about Susan Rice and what uh, she believes uh, are the nation's priorities that uh, she decided not to uh, pursue this because she thought it would be bad <clears throat> the circus that would ensue uh, in what would in ed it would absolutely have led to her confirmation had the president made that choice uh, was not worth uh, was not worth it to her. You mentioned that Mr. Brennan came in and talked to the <clears throat> president at 10:30. This is obviously a situation of enormous magnitude and tragedy. Does the president and Mr. Brennan at that time or since have any sense of what this is or isn't in regards to terrorism or anything like that? You know, we just. Uh, don't have anything right now to provide to you in terms of uh, an, an incident that just happened a few hours ago and that is uh, being responded to and uh, investigated as we speak. And as we get more information about uh, what happened and who was responsible, we'll obviously uh, provide it to you and have uh, judgments to provide to you, but I just don't have that at this time. I know this may elicit the same <coughs> answer, but just for the record, mm -hmm. uh, it's customary at times like this for a president to make phone calls. Mm -hmm. Can you give us any idea if he's called the governor or any of the other relevant officials or reached out in a direct way personally? I don't have any communications of the president to report out to you at this time. But again, as, uh, as the day progresses, uh, we will provide you with more information as it becomes available. In regard to Jake's question, mm -hmm. my intent of ears perked up when you were saying there have been no proposals from Republicans on entitlements. I just want to clarify that you're referring to their public pronouncements, not to the conversations that go on face to face? Because that sounded like a readout. Well, well it's not a readout of any meetings. I'm just saying that... Uh, uh, that would be an important point to understand. If 
if they're not saying anything in these private meetings different than they were to say publicly, that would be helpful for the public to understand. I think broadly speaking, again, and it, I guess it's commendable because their presentations in public are... Uh, Utterly consistent, would you say? I think that would be fair to say. You are comfortable, quite obviously, with the Clinton era tax rates for the reasons you have said, economically and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Are you similarly comfortable with the Clinton era level of spending, even for an inflation adjustment, as an example? Well, I think you'd have to give me a little more specificity. If you're making the point that under Bill Clinton, uh, deficits were reduced and turned into surpluses, we obviously find that a commendable record. Right. And there's less discretionary spending, there's less entitlement spending, things like that. But again, what's your, what's your question? Would, would that be a level of spending the President? I think a level, level of spending, spending from 20 years ago? No, I don't think no, that's... Inflation adjustment, just for I, example. I, I'm not going to make policy from here based on top-line numbers. I think that the President has demonstrated. Let, let's back up, too. When we talk about this deal, uh, remember back in the summer of 2011, after uh, a grand bargain was not achieved. Uh, Republicans could not, in the end, uh, go along with revenue being part of the package. Uh, the uh, Budget Control Act was passed and signed into law, agreed to by the President as well as uh, leaders uh, in Congress and, and, and uh, approved by significant uh, percentages of each party in each House. Speaker of the House banner at that time declared that he had gotten, on behalf of House Republicans, 98 percent of what he sought. So let me remind you, when we talk about what this President has been willing to do, uh, that at the time when he signed into law $1.1 $1 trillion in discretionary spending cuts, uh, that was viewed by Speaker Boehner as a great victory for Republicans. Uh, additionally, that bill uh, created a super committee and, and uh, set up a system where an additional $1.2 trillion in deficit reduction uh, needed to be achieved, or else this sequester would kick in, and that's why we face uh, the fiscal cliff, or one half of it. Uh, but it is important to know when we talk about who's willing to move here, who's willing to compromise, who's willing to uh, accept some of the other party's goals that when the President of the United States signed into law the Budget Control Act in the summer of 2011 and signed into law $1.1 $1 .1 trillion in cuts, Speaker Boehner said it was a 98 percent victory for Republicans. Alexis. Jay, there's some uh, reports from our good friends at Bloomberg News that <coughs> there's discussion among Senate Republicans of providing a fallback on the fiscal cliff, <coughs> uh, specifically on the middle class tax cuts and creating a series of votes that would provide <coughs> cover for House Republicans who may not <coughs> uh, vote uh, one way or the other, but would get to choose. Uh, what I'm asking is, did Speaker Boehner and the President discuss that kind of sequencing that might at least move that portion along before the end of the year? I don't have a readout for you on their conversation beyond what I've provided. I can say that it's, I, you know, there are a lot of uh, ideas floated by anonymous uh, folks up on the Hill in particular about uh, different proposals that may or may not materialize. What we have yet to see is a proposal of any kind with any kind of specificity. Uh, so I can't really comment on uh, random thought bubbles. So another quick follow-up on um, Susan Rice. Um, with all due respect Blue, Bloomberg does better than thought bubbles. Um, Susan Rice, in the category of attacks that you described as um, misguided and unfair, would you put Senator Collins' reservations in that category? I uh, do not recall specifically what she said, but I certainly profoundly disagree with any uh, negative assessment of Ambassador Rice's qualifications for uh, a top foreign policy position uh, based on what she said on those Sunday shows that weekend. Uh, it's just a spurious and ridiculous allegation. And uh, so, yes, if that, I, I, I can't recall specifically what she claimed were, uh, were the, was the cause of her reservations, but uh, if, if, if that was it, uh, it's bogus. Reed. Uh Jay, earlier this week, uh, Seventh Circuit uh, overturned Illinois, the President's home state's law uh, forbidding concealed carry. Uh, does the President agree with that decision? Do you think, uh, does you think the court decided correctly, one? And two, uh, earlier you suggested that today is not the correct day 
to debate gun control laws. Um, but given that this is the second uh, considerable incident this week after the one in Oregon, when would be a good time to have that debate? I've stated repeatedly what the President's position uh, is on uh, legislation that uh, uh, Ms. Yellen mentioned and, and, uh, and more broadly. Uh, my, my point is that as this incident is unfolding in Connecticut, uh, you know, our, our, our minds and our focus need to be on uh, what's happening there and providing uh, assistance uh, where we can uh, to those who need it in Connecticut. But does the President have a position on the law in his home state? Uh, I have not asked him, and I would refer you to the Justice Department for views on uh, issues like that. Roger. Uh, thanks. <coughs> I want to shift to a question of transparency, uh, Jay. Bloomberg we are the most transparent administration in the history of this country. Uh, okay, let me see what your answer is to this. The <laughs> <laughs> Bloomberg News filed Freedom of Information Act requests for government agencies for fiscal 11, wanting to get our travel expenses from the top officials in those cabinets. This was partly to test the President's pledge of being the most transparent mm -hmm. in history. Now, six months later, most of the cabinet is in defiance of the law. They haven't disclosed this information. This includes Hillary Clinton, Kathleen Sebelius, and Eric Holder, the official in charge of monitoring the executive performance on FOIAs. Mm -hmm. So are the President's cabinet colleagues ignoring his instructions on openness? Roger, I appreciate the question. I'm not even aware of uh, Bloomberg's FOIA request, so I think we'll have to, to take it. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of the issue at all. I can't confirm anything you just said. Uh, so I can't comment on it. Okay. Try once more. A FOIA requires a 20-day response. You know that as a former reporter. It's now six months. Again, I'm not aware. You're asking me to comment on something that is uh, I'm not aware of, and I would hesitate in all cases to do that. My general rule is not to guess at answers. Would you take the question? Though? I would certainly take the question. Yeah. Um, now that Susan Rice is out of the running, um, the president. You want to know who is? Yeah, well, yes, if you yeah. care to respond to that. But yeah. um, the president's losing someone who would have brought diversity to his cabinet. So how important is it to the president now that his cabinet, with her out of the running, reflects the sort of diversity that we see throughout the rest of the country? And is that going to affect his decision-making process? I think the president has always believed that in order to achieve uh, the highest level of excellence in uh, his cabinet and more broadly in his administration, that uh, diversity is important. Uh, I would note that Ambassador Rice remains in his cabinet uh, and remains a valued advisor on foreign policy matters uh, as uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. But I, you know, I think that the President's approach uh, has always been to seek excellence and as part of that believes that uh, diversity um, in finding highly qualified candidates for senior positions uh, enhances excellence. <clears throat> Jay, Jay, can, can you uh, shed any more light on the President's uh, reaction to this news in Connecticut? From that 10.30 uh, briefing with Brennan, has he been watching the news? Is he getting regular up-to-date updates from the ground? And how often are those occurring? Um, just those, these last two hours, sort of how has he been spending that time absorbing all of this? Well, <clears throat> I have been out here, so I haven't been with him, uh, but I can uh, tell you that he was initially informed by John Brennan uh, and is being uh, regularly updated. He uh, obviously is, has other meetings uh, that he is uh, involved in, uh, but I can't, I just don't know whether uh, he's uh, watched any of the TV reports on it. Uh, but he is being regularly updated by his team led by John Brennan. Is it significant he was informed by Brennan and not Tom Donnellan? Bre John Brennan is his Homeland Security Advisor. This is an event occurring in the homeland. Law enforcement authorities are telling multiple media outlets <clears throat> that more than a dozen uh, school children have been killed in this incident and more than 20 people have been killed. Mm -hmm. um, you seem shaken. A lot of us here feel shaken. Certainly there's something from the President's response to this news that doesn't confirm any details mm -hmm. specifically, uh, but just news reports well, that yeah, you can share with us that, that would uh, allow us to understand his personal human reaction. Sure. I, I, no, I appreciate the question, and I would just say that those news reports have come since I've uh, come out here, so I can't confirm victims, and therefore not able to confirm victims. It's hard for me to give you a reaction of the president to 
uh, reports of uh, <clears throat> victims, especially children. I can just tell you that as a father, uh, incidents like these uh, weigh heavily on him and, uh, and I think everyone who has children and can imagine uh, the enormous uh, suffering that accompanies an event like this if what you say is true. Uh, but I, I prefer to provide you more information once I have it and once we have confirmed uh, some of the reports that you mentioned. Right. Should yeah. we expect the President to address it? Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's certainly uh, possible, if not likely, that the President will have uh, something to say. I, don't, I can't tell you whether or not it's a given, uh, depending on you know, the reports that we're hearing, uh, whether it's a, a statement, a written statement, or otherwise, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, Governor Malloy's office in Connecticut has said that the President has talked with him. Do you, and I don't know if that happened before you were out here, if we could get some sort of a read out of what he's saying. Yeah, and I'll have further information for you on uh, the President's uh, responses to this matter um, as, as it becomes available. Andre? Uh, thank you, Jay, and uh, condolences on Connecticut. Uh, <coughs> The President signed the bill today, the PNTR and Magnitsky uh, bill. Uh, Moscow keeps saying that it will hurt the relationship. Uh, do you agree with that? Or is there anything uh, you are looking at to limit the damage? Well, the President signed a bill that repealed uh, uh, the jackson Vanek legislation, which is something uh, that both this President and Russia had sought. and. Uh, as you saw from his statement, he commended the House and Senate for working on a bipartisan basis to pass legislation uh, to end the application of the jackson Vanek Amendment to Russia and Moldova, uh, allowing him to extend permanent normal trade relations to both countries. And he looks forward to receiving and signing this legislation. He signed it today, as you know. Uh, the legislation ensures that American businesses and workers are able to take full advantage of WTO rules and market access commitments that the United States worked so hard to negotiate. Uh, the United States is also one step closer to realizing job-creating opportunities and leveling the playing field for American workers, farmers, ranchers, and service providers. Uh, the President's administration will continue to work with Congress and our partners to support those seeking a free and democratic future for Russia and promote the rule of law and respect for human rights around the world. Yes, Jay, but this is the, this last part uh, that the Russians seem uh, to think is unwarranted and uh, object to. And uh, this is why I'm asking uh, about uh, this. Uh, actually, the, President Putin, when he was asked uh, about it yesterday or uh, a few days ago, he said it seems like it's a, uh, an example of politicizing the issue of, politi of, of politics. Uh, you as, right. as, as you said, politics at its worst. Well, I hardly think that. I think the. Uh, uh, the legislation uh, is important legislation, uh, all of it, and the President uh, was happy to sign it, and he believes it's an important step forward in our relationship with Russia. Uh, if I could, I'll just uh, let you know that the President recently completed a phone call uh, with FBI Director Mueller, as well as a call with the Governor of Connecticut, Dan Malloy, to receive the latest information on the situation there in Connecticut and to express his condolences and concern for those who have lost loved ones as well as those uh, who were injured. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would just follow up on the shooting uh, questions. In, in Aurora, Colorado, the President said, we all reflect on how we can do something about some of the senseless violence that, en that ends up marring this country. We give you a chance maybe, maybe to get into some of these things. I mean, has there been enough reflection since Aurora? Yeah, I really uh, encourage uh, all of us to give uh, a moment here to focus on uh, what is an unfolding tragedy in Connecticut, uh, and not to uh, engage uh, in you know, Washington policy battles of, uh, of long running. Uh, the day, you know, we do that often, and, and it's appropriate, and I'm sure the day for this will come, but today's not that day in our mind. We're focused right now on what's happening in Connecticut. Yes? Uh, on a foreign policy question, uh, Next month, uh, Afghan President Karzai will be here on January 7. Would that be President's last meeting with the foreign leader at the end of his first term? And secondly, what are the issues that the President wants to discuss 
Green Rock Gun Uh, well, I uh, appreciate the question. The, um, uh, we're expecting President Karzai in the, d during the week of January 7th. I don't think a, a specific date has uh, uh, been decided on. And, and I, I have no other foreign leader meetings to uh, preview for you, so I can't answer the question about whether that would be his last meeting with a foreign leader prior uh, to his uh, inauguration a few weeks later. Um, uh, you know, the President uh, and President Karzai look forward to discussing a shared vision of Afghanistan beyond 2014 uh, to include the post-2014 role of the United States in Afghanistan. Uh, their meeting will be an important opportunity to discuss implementation of the strategic uh, partnership the two presidents signed in May uh, to include the progress we're making in negotiating the bilateral, bilateral security agreement that would replace our current SOFA and lay out the rules of the road for a potential U.S. military presence after 2014. The President also looks forward to discussing an Afghan-led peace process uh, as well as the region and the future of Afghanistan's security forces. So to answer your question, those would be uh, what we would expect to be the topics of conversation at that meeting. And is the President disappointed that the Taliban are not coming for peace negotiations? Well, we support an Afghan-led process of reconciliation. We believe that that's uh, essential for the long term. Uh, you know, prospects of peace in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't have any updates uh, on uh, that process from here. Victoria. Uh, last week, Syrian troops were seen loading bombs with chemical weapons onto trucks, and the President warned Syria that use of chemical weapons is a red line. Isn't use of chemical weapons a bit late for the red line? Shouldn't the red line be movement of chemical weapons? I mean, once they've been used, damage is done. The President addressed this very clearly from this podium, what, uh, what his views are, are on that matter, and uh, they regard both the use of chemical we weapons, the potential for use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime, as well as uh, movement in the sense of proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction like chemical weapons. Uh, I think our uh, warnings about uh, any consideration of the use of uh, these weapons uh, were extremely clear and stark. Uh, our promise of significant consequences should uh, the Assad regime uh, go down that road uh, were very uh, clear and stark, and, and uh, they remain in place. And I think that uh, we share concern about this with our international partners and will continue to carry that message forward. What is the level of concern that it, it seems from the reporting on this that it, it isn't known whether the order that was given to, to get these chemical weapons going was given by senior leaders in the Assad regime, Assad himself, or by just some field commander? What is the level of concern well, I think you're, that you're, maybe you're citing, Assad you're is citing uh, not in You're citing reports that are based on purported intelligence information, and I'm not going to uh, discuss uh, matters of intelligence, uh, except to say that uh, we remain concerned about this issue. We have made our position extremely and starkly clear uh, about the consequences of, uh, uh, should uh, the Assad regime go down that road, uh, and we uh, re reiterate those concerns today. All the way in the back. Yep. Thanks, Jay. I wanted to go back to your uh, comment about transparency and ask, um, the year's coming to an end, and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is still in the Ecuadorian embassy. I uh, wanted to get your response. Uh, one of the reasons he hasn't returned to Sweden for questioning on sexual allegations is because he fears he would be extradited to the U.S. Uh, where is the Obama administration in uh, the investigation of Assange and WikiLeaks? And what is your response to those who say, um, you know, Julian Assange, Bradley Manning are examples of uh, the president being anything but transparent? Well, I entirely disagree. And in terms of investigations of that nature, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. Thanks, sir. Thanks very much.